What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura. So just to knock a couple things out of the way real quick, normally I like to review games after I 100% them, which includes things beyond achievements. However, with older games like Arcanum that don't even have achievements, it's easier to just label it a regular review, but just letting people know. The other part is this is going to be done with the unofficial Arcanum patch, or the unofficial patch, and that is because Arcanum without that patch is borderline unplayable, and not even so much because the game is in a rough state, which it's definitely pretty buggy without the patch, mind you, but there is an issue with Windows 10 specifically that will cause Arcanum to run at like 10 frames per second without the patch, so that right there is enough reason to install it. Now it does have the option of using things like restored content as well as uh, some other alternative campaigns that were made. For the sake of this review, I just clicked the options that were bug fixes and a high resolution pack so it uh, looked a little better. All that out of the way, Arcanum was made by Troika Games. Troika Games was founded by Tim Kaine, Leonard Boyarsky, and Jason Anderson after they left Interplay, which was a big game company at the time. That said, Troika Games has a very storied history, but the very first game that they actually put out there was Arcanum, and they were under constant pressure from their publisher, Sierra Games, to basically rush this thing out the door, which is pretty much the story of all of Troika's games, the three of them that they wound up making before they went out of business, but were focused on Arcanum. Now these days, Arcanum is owned by Activision, which uh, given recent events surrounding the time of this video, I feel is important to mention because I think it's important to understand who your money's going to when you pay for something. But that said, Arcanum is very cheap. You can regularly pick it up for five bucks or even less on a sale sometimes. But Arcanum by itself is an isometric CRPG that actually features real-time with pause or turn-based combat, which is uh, pretty remarkable back in 2003 when this was initially released. And the big hook with Arcanum is that it is sort of steampunk meets fantasy. It is a world in the middle of an industrial revolution, quite literally mirroring our own world's industrial revolution in some ways, but definitely technology from around that time frame meets traditional high fantasy such as elves, dwarves, etc. Now that's important to note because a pervading theme of this game is the balance between technology and magic. Now we'll talk a bit more about this, but essentially the two cancel each other out and that's what you need to know at the start of the video. Now the setup for the game is that you are a foreigner from somewhere, it doesn't ever try to explain that at all, which is probably for the best. You are on an airship that gets shot down. You are the only survivor, and when you come to, you see a dying gnome. He hands you a ring and tells you to find someone. Now, immediately after this, you come to, and a man named Virgil walks up to you and exclaims that you are the living one, because you walking away from this crash has essentially fulfilled a prophecy, and he believes you to be the living one, which is supposed to be a prophesized reincarnation of a god. Now, that's all we're really going to go into story-wise, because I don't want to spoil anything too major by any means in case anybody does decide to play this. But I do want to mention a couple things generally speaking about the story. One positive and one negative. Now the negative is pacing issues. While Arcanum is a lot of fun to play, the main story itself is really just kind of used as a reason to drag you from location to location at times and probably none more so than the very beginning of the game because in what should be the opening moments of a story kind of hooking you in and trying to reel you in, Arcanum has this habit of just sending you on quests where they need you to go talk to somebody but you don't even know who it is you're trying to talk to. And as a result, especially at the very beginning of the game, the story really fails to give you a significant hook until you get a few hours into it when the story picks up. The other part of this that I wanted to mention, which is actually positive, is that the story is highly replayable. It's genuinely very impressive how much reactivity they managed to add to the story of this game in terms of your character, your race, how you chose to approach things, are you good or evil. Like, truthfully, in, in terms of a modern comparison, the only game that I can really think of that had this level of reactivity recently was Divinity Original Sin 2. And seeing how they did this in 2003, that is a very impressive feat to me. Now, that said, let's jump into character creation here. Character creation in Arcanum is a unique system. And that said, I cannot express enough how much you need to read the manual before you create a character, or at least start creating characters. Every copy of Arcanum, regardless of where you buy it, does actually come with the manual. 
it should be included in the files or when you load up the game sometimes there's an option there as well depending on where you got it honestly if you're going to play this game read the manual because character creation itself in addition to being a unique system also has a horrendous ui The UI throughout the game isn't amazing by any means. Now, before we jump too much into character creation, I do want to mention that if you do decide to play this game, what I'd recommend you do, again, read the manual and then make a couple of burner characters, characters that you don't expect to play very long outside of maybe the first hour or two of gameplay to kind of get your bearings and see what does what type of stuff. Personally, I went through a couple of those characters before I settled on something that I actually liked. So when it comes to creating a character, you have a lot of choices right off the bat. What is your character's race? You can be an elf, a dwarf, a human, a half-ogre, a halfling, a half-elf even, which for the most part is uh, standard fantasy stuff. Now that said, there are several uh, cut races that didn't actually make it into the game, and furthermore, some races can only be male. You cannot pick the female version of it. If you look up the reasoning behind this, supposedly it came down to a memory issue at the time the game was made. And in addition to those things, it is also possible to pick a preset character if you find character creation to be a bit daunting. But once you jump into the next page, the main thing you need to realize is that you're going to have what are just called points in the UI, but they're essentially the character points. Now, character points are used for literally everything in character creation. They are used for your attributes, your skills, your crafting, which is like the technology piece of it, and your magic. You will have to use one pool of points for everything. And to be clear, there are hundreds of options. The level cap in the game is 50. You're going to get one character point per level normally, and then every five levels, so 5, 10, 15, etc., you'll get two character points. While you don't necessarily need to stick to a rigid build, It is pretty important that you understand what you want your character to do, at least generally, so you know where to allocate these points ahead of time. Because if you're just picking and choosing stuff as you level up without any real focus, you're going to be in for a bad time. That said, the easiest build to make is melee, for sure. They simply just require a lot less across the board than most other characters. They pretty much only need to pick up melee and dodge, which are just regular skills, and then they can increase their attributes accordingly, and then you give them some gear and they're good to go. Whereas other builds, like, for instance, someone using firearms, you would have your firearm skill, your attribute, of course. If you wanted to make your own firearms, you would need tech. If you needed to make the bullets for your firearms, that would also be tech. Mages especially, because there are 16 different schools of magic to choose from as a mage in Arcanum, which makes knowing exactly what schools you need to uh, have spells in and do the things you want to do is also very important. Now, this isn't meant to be a guide by any means, just kind of explaining some of what you're going to see here. Honestly, a lot of people, I wouldn't be surprised if they saw this character creation screen and just stopped right there, because again, the UI is absolutely terrible, and the game does very little in-game to actually explain any of this to you. In fact, in some cases, it's kind of misleading. So again, if you do decide to play this yourself, read the manual. Let's talk about some world building. Now, interestingly enough, Arcanum is actually an open world game, which you wouldn't realize if you were just playing it normally. Because normally, you're going to bring up a world map once you reach the edge of the regular maps, which is done via more terrible UI up on the top uh, icon bar, if you will. When you get to the edge of a area in town, the local map will switch to a world map, which you can then click on to travel via the world map. Now, that said, if you were to just not click the world map icon, you could keep walking, and you would theoretically eventually reach the next place. Now, I have heard, I'm obviously not about to confirm this myself, that walking from one end to this open world to the next in that manner would take about 35 hours of real time. I don't know how true that is. I just thought it was neat, especially since it was uh, basically pointless. There's nothing really out in the wilderness to find. Everything is kind of in locations, which you're going to learn the location of by questing and doing things for people who will then reveal their locations, at which point you can travel directly there. It is possible to find things while you're traveling on the world map, such as locations, and the cities and things are always there. So if, for instance, you already know where the capital cities are, you can just go straight to them without actually having to learn their location first. And while you're traveling on them, you're very likely to encounter random encounters, which is kind of standard CRPG stuff, but it does get a little annoying at times because sometimes the random encounters can be a bit excessive. Now beyond that, the World of Arcanum really shows off the 
magic versus technology landscape, so to speak. So as I mentioned earlier, technology and magic kind of cancel each other out, basically meaning that if they don't exist in balance, whichever thing there is more of basically weakens the other one. So in towns where there's just a ton of technology and there's a bunch of engines, magic users are just not as strong. And we can see this play out when, for instance, if you try to board a train, you have to fill out a questionnaire about whether or not you are a mage. Because some mages, if they are powerful enough and are close to the engine, will just cause the engine to stop working, which is why most mages have to ride at the very back of the train. In fact, if you are strong enough of a mage, they just won't let you on the train at all. Another cool bit of world building is that you will find newspapers, or you can buy newspapers from town criers, throughout the game, and these newspapers will actually reflect side quests and main story quests that you've completed as the game drags on, which is honestly just a really cool bit of world building from a game this age. And beyond those things, we see this uh, dichotomy kind of reflected just in the types of quests you're going to get. For instance, there is a town in the main capital city where you can actually find some orc workers who are trying to unionize, because that was a very common thing during the Industrial Revolution. And other times you'll see mages trying to destroy the local steam engine because it's weakening their magic powers. So because of all of this, the world simultaneously draws this really weird line of feeling incredibly alive as you're doing quests and taking on these locations and just seeing all the various ways in which you can tackle these quests and how the game reacts to them. But at the same time, due to this uh, technology and magic infighting, so to speak, there's also this weird feeling of entropy that kind of pervades the world. And adds to this weird sense of like, yeah, this world is in a rough place. We better do something about this. At least that's how I felt about it. Now, next up, let's talk about uh, probably the worst part of the game, to be honest with you. And that is the combat. So combat comes in real time with pause or turn based. And truthfully, the game does both of them terribly. Now, the good news is, just because the way this game is made, there are tons of ways to cheese combat. Melee characters, if you went all in on it, are incredibly strong. They basically can't be hit and could just stand there and punch things to death. There are some mage builds that are basically invincible towards the late game. Plenty of ways to cheese combat, which is good, because again, the actual systems at play are not good at all. All of it feels incredibly clunky. Trying to use spells or items from your hotbar, which again, terrible UI, feels really rough and takes some getting used to. Enemies in combat like to target you specifically, which can be incredibly frustrating, especially in the early game when you're very squishy. That said, it will at least be over pretty quickly because combat in Arcanum is nonetheless pretty fast paced, which is uh, probably to the benefit because again, combat is just not good. And that said, you should definitely save incredibly often because it's very easy to just get an unlucky crit against you and you just die outright sometimes. So save constantly. Now, next up we have the companions. There are a ton of companions, which was common of games back in this period. When you look at Baldur's Gate 1, it is very much a very similar situation to this game, actually. So in Arcanum, there are tons of companions to choose from, but basically all of them have almost no story at all. Some of them do have a story, which is very true. Virgil especially, he's probably the most closely tied to the main plot. And then all of the other companions that are going to have a little bit of story for you are basically thrown in front of you via the main quest. And you can find a ton of other optional companions that if you meet certain requirements, like a charisma score or being a technology-minded person or someone who is more of a mage, then these companions might come with you. Because what I haven't mentioned up to this point is that in addition to your regular character creation, there is two other systems at play here. A evil versus good meter, which you can see in the character editor as well. And this is just how you approach quests. Do you do evil things? Do you do good things? This meter will move one way or the other, and some characters prefer one or the other. The other thing is uh, technology versus magic. So I've talked about how there's this interplay between these two things in the world. Well, that is also reflected on your character sheet. If you have a bunch of tech skills, you will be pushed more towards the tech side of this spectrum, so to speak, on the right side of your character editor. If you're a mage, you'll be pushed towards the mage side of it. Now that is especially important when you are considering taking companions with you, because if you are a mage, tech skills and things will break around you. If you are a tech-minded person, healing and spells and things from a mage won't work on you. So that's an important thing to consider when taking companions along with you. 
along with meeting the requirements to even take said companions with you. Again, most of them are honestly just faces on a portrait. I wouldn't worry about it too much outside of the companions that the game gives you via main quest, basically or at least puts you in front of, such as Virgil or Magnus. So all of that stuff said, guys, let's talk some positives and some negatives. So positives is uh, very easy. The world of Arcanum is fantastic. They did an amazing job building this world. It is, in my opinion, pretty much the best part of the game. There are just so many cool ideas at play here with the uh, technology and the magic and the high fantasy stuff at the same time, but it's all weirdly steampunk. And it all just weirdly works together so well. That combined with your ability to just approach the main quest and things just how you want makes the game incredibly replayable and that's a big plus as well. Now the negatives, as I've mentioned several times, uh, the UI is absolutely garbage. The combat is also not particularly fun, which is weird because the game is so replayable and despite the combat being bad, you still want to replay it. And then on top of that, character creation. Character creation is a real mess. Just from the UI to the systems at play, it's hard to jump into this game to the point where I would say the people who never finished Arcanum are definitely probably quitting within the first couple hours, which isn't anything to blame them for as the game honestly does not open very well. The conclusion there is that it's a fantastic world, but it's hard to get into a little bit. So the saving grace here is that the game is super cheap. So, you know, if you got five bucks and you got a few hours to burn learning some systems, then Arcanum is honestly a great way to do that. And I honestly do think people should play it. Now, that said, before I actually wrap this video up, I did want to talk about one more thing. Because while I really do love Arcanum, I can't help but feel while I'm playing this, where is the reboot or the sequel to this game? Because it's incredible. It deserves one. Whoever owns this IP must be sitting on a gold mine, I thought to myself while I played this. So I did some digging, and it is actually very easy to find out who owns the IP to Arcanum. There's no big mystery to solve. The IP, as I mentioned at the start of the video, is of course owned by Activision, who has chosen to do absolutely nothing with it. Now, I imagine that's purely because they can't find a way to monetize it to their liking, because it would basically have to be an RPG. And given the kind of cult classic status of Arcanum, I don't think there's any way Activision specifically could make the type of games they are known for and not piss everybody off who likes Arcanum. So while it means nothing, I did want to throw this out there. What I think would be incredible, but is definitely not going to happen, is if Activision would sell this IP to Microsoft specifically. Microsoft, because the three founders of Troika Games all work for Microsoft, if you were unaware. Two of them work for Obsidian Entertainment, and one of them works for In Exile Entertainment. And while, again, it will never happen, if Activision were to sell the Arcanum IP to Microsoft, you could theoretically see a sequel by the same people who built the original. And I think that would be absolutely incredible. But again, sadly, it's probably never going to happen. So with all of that said, guys, Arcanum, there you go. Honestly, what a gem of a classic game. If you haven't played it, and this sounds even remotely interesting to you, I urge you to play it. But regardless of any of that, though, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.